Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is Nancy Fund. She's one of the highest profile women venture capitalists, and she's also one of the most successful. She runs DBL Partners, uh, and she's going to tell us the story of how she came to be in that position via some of her early bets, being an early investor in Tesla among them. I know Nancy because we sit together on the board of the Hawthorne Club, which is a club for senior women in the energy sector. And you'll be asking, why am I involved? <laughs> since I'm not a senior woman in the energy sector, and that hopefully will become clear. So. Let's bring Nancy into the conversation. Good evening here in the UK. I'm in the UK, you're not. Hi, Michael. It's great to see you uh, across the, the pond, as they say, and um, wonderful to, to get together and talk about this. It is the day after the election here in the US, so didn't get as much sleep as, as I usually do, but uh, rare to go here. Well, thank you very much. And yes, it has been, uh, it's been one of those days because I uh, have been following the results of the elections. So I also didn't get much sleep. And then in fact, today, uh, some people will be asking, well, why is he wearing a, uh, you know, a jacket, not a tie, but a suit? Um, well, in fact, um, today I got hitched to my partner, Alice. We entered a civil partnership um, today. So I'm joining you on, a, on, on just one of those days when uh, you stay up all night watching an election and then uh, get married, but uh, there you go. Yeah, why not? I mean, uh, maybe you have a graduation later this evening, I'm not sure, but uh, love to share this milestone with you and congratulations well, to you, Alice. Uh, and what else, what, could, what better thing could I do than talk to you on this evening? And uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure your, your partner now, Alice, is, is thrilled that the, the, the first Alice is very she Alice is very understanding, uh, I hope. Um, and, uh, and we've certainly got some, some stuff planned. So, but thank you for joining me. Um, I want to start, if I might, at the beginning, because I said in my preamble that you're uh, one of the most successful venture capitalists of your generation, uh, and also one of the highest profile, one of the very, very few women venture capitalists. So could you go back to the beginning uh, and, and talk us through that journey? How did, you, how did you end up on that career path, which is quite spectacular? Well, I, I wish I could tell you that I was, you know, ever from a young age that I just wanted to be a venture capitalist. So I just worked really hard to, to get that job. But really nothing could be further from the truth because to be honest, I didn't know what a venture capitalist was until I was in my mid twenties. It, um, it wasn't something on my radar. I, when I graduated from college, I went to work for the Sierra Club in Washington, DC. I was a tree hugger. From, from way back. So, uh, you know, I was part of a, a lobbying team as a junior member. So the path to venture capital was not linear. Uh, it, it really happened because I do, I've always had an interest in uh, two things, entrepreneurship and innovation. And part of that is my father was an engineer. He was an inventor, sort of grew up with all of these gizmos around the house. So uh, just a soft spot, spot in my heart for, for entrepreneurs and inventors. At the same time, uh, I've always been interested in the interface between science and society and, and, and social issues and have been active. You know, the Sierra Club is one example. Uh, worked for Jerry Brown when he was governor the first time. So I, I'm in this odd hybrid of, of liking the technology and the entrepreneurship, but also really interested in, in how do we you know, improve uh, policy for, for society at large. And so all of that is to say that I, I worked in government, I worked at uh, Stanford Medical School for a while, I worked for the Sierra Club, and then I went to work at Intel after business school. And that was, for me, a real opportunity to see how uh, in the early days of the semiconductor industry, 
uh, you were shaping society. You were having this amazing impact, and there were all and and so I I actually was a speech writer. One of my jobs for the one of the founders of Intel, Bob Noyce, uh, because he was trying to communicate the power of electronics to a broader lay audience, and so I was. One of the few non-engineers at Intel back then. So you had to really, you had to really think about the question because you were actually <laughs> writing the lines. Actually, yes. Why, why do we do innovation? And how, yeah. how can we persuade people it's good? Maybe we should just be good. Exactly. And the good news is that Bob Noyes, who passed away at a way too young an age, but he was a Renaissance man. He was up for anything if it, if, it, if he felt. You know, one time I had him singing a song in the middle of a speech just to show the link between music and electronics and things like that. So anyway, um, really caught the technology bug, uh, but wanted to move to San Francisco. Uh, I, speaking of getting married, I was going to be married and my husband was based uh, in the East Bay near San Francisco. And even back then, uh, Intel in, in Santa Clara County was a long commute. So I said, well, I'll go work in San Francisco. Uh, now that um, sort of my life is changing. And back then, which I know is hard for people to believe, uh, there were no tech companies in San Francisco. Uh, there just right. weren't. Uh, this I was, was going to ask mid 80s. Uh, mid -80s. Like, I, was a, uh, I ended up at, um, at, at business school in 88. And when I was at business school, San Francisco was kind of artsy and it was a great place yeah. and it was very cool. But there was nothing in, nothing in San Francisco. It was, all, it was all in the Sand Hills Road. I mean, you had to go and drive to get to this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, there was one thing that I found, and that was one of the early venture capital investment banks dedicated to uh, the emerge, then emerging tech sector called Hamburg and Quits. It was headquartered in the Rust Building on, on uh, Montgomery Street in San Francisco. And the way I got there, so I said, okay, I got to go work there because um, that financing is the only thing they do in San Francisco. And so I, I better learn how to do that. And the way I did that, this was in 1984, is I, it, I just, I'm telling the story because it's the day after the election here. Um, I, San Francisco was where the Democratic Convention was in 1984. So I said to my bosses at Intel, why don't we do a, a, a party in San Francisco for that convention? Uh, and we'll bring all the tech people and the politicians, Bill Brad, Senator Bill Bradley, uh, the, the head of, of Apple. And so we did that. Uh, and that, and one of the people I, I brought on to be a sponsor of that party, uh, and this was when Nancy Pelosi was the chair of the Democratic uh, con Convention then. She wasn't yet a congresswoman. But one of the people I brought on was Bill Hamrick, the founder of Hamrick and Quist, because he was an active Democrat. And so I got to meet him there, and I went to interview a few months later, and that's how I ended up at Hamrick and Quist and started as a securities analyst and switched to venture capital. Right. So I was going to ask you, because you'd gone from being a speechwriter, but you'd already become financial at that point. Well, I, you know, I had gone to business school, so I, I knew the tools, um, but no, I, I didn't, I, I also didn't know I had to show up at like five in the morning because h and was on market hours. And so I, I was completely <laughs> ignorant. So they, I think what- They didn't tell like, you- they didn't tell you that at interview. Oh, by the way, yeah. this is going to ruin your, your, yeah. your, your, your all those lions that you want to have. You're not going to have them. No. And so some of my friends at the time said, well, you only switched to venture, so you wouldn't have to get up so early and go to work because <laughs> you work the market hours. And this is a funny thing because around this time, I mean, as I say, 88, I went off to business school and I'm pretty sure I would have tried to interview with Hambrick and Quist. I wonder whether you interviewed me and probably found that I was this, you know, s snotty British guy absolutely of no value to the business forget him he's one of the <laughs> one of the easy ones to to put in the in the ding pile well no there were a lot of in fact we had a road scholar that was our ceo at one point of a good friend of mine dan case uh, so there's there was a, it, i think london was one of our first offices it's too bad we didn't connect back then but i'm glad we are now well, how funny because the uh, roads of course that person would have gone to london to open that office then and i was coming the other way as a as a harkness fellow uh, not yeah. which, which which sort of disappeared as a thing, but was quite prestigious at the time. Okay, so you end up, you're, so now you're in California and let's, let, you know, let, let's trundle through this. You ended up then doing real serious, uh, uh, you know, venture capital. When did you start to realize, or when did you start to get your, when was your first sort of really big success where you thought, actually, I'm quite good at this? 
Oh, wow. I mean, it, it took a while. Um, I worked with other um, colleagues at H&Q, and we made some amazing investments. Um, Odwala, which uh, sadly is, is no longer um, a thing, but was the first fresh juice company. We, we did that one very early on. I was, uh, since I worked at the medical school at Stanford, I did some life science instrumentation investments like mass spectrometers and things like that that eventually were used in, in environmental cleanup kinds of situations. So that was one of my first uh, efforts to, to invest in, in environmental cleanup and, and sustainability. So, um, so you, so you we, kept the idea and this kind of the Sierra Club, uh, sort of the, the tree hugger origins, you kept them alive, but you didn't over trade them in the early years, but you did try to keep it. Absolutely, because yeah, I, I was, it's always, I, I would throttle it up and down. The good news is that, and this is, a lot of people don't know this, that Bill Hambrack was also a, tr a tree hugger and he was on, I think he was on the board of the Sierra Club. He, we actually raised a tiny environmental fund in 1990, way too early. Uh, that's when we did the Odawala in investment because it reduced the use of pesticides and we did some instrumentation investments. Uh, then went back, then of course the internet exploded in the region and so we all became tech, you know, internet investors. And so it wasn't until that uh, post.com crash that we, uh, we set our sights on climate investing. Uh, so this is really interesting because I had uh, a couple of weeks ago um, Ramiz Nam, and I also had last, uh, I think it's just come out last week, uh, it just had its premiere, um, uh, Alke Hoekstra, who is a Dutch guy, but he was working on internet stuff. And of course, Ramiz comes from that sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the silicon tech background, uh, as do I. And we were talking about why is it that we found it sort of easier to see the magnitude of some of these trends? Why is it that the whole energy sector was sort of saying, oh, you know, it must be oil and gas forever and coal can never be dethroned. And then we came along and sort of said, no. Um, uh, I mean, is that, so you were, you were having, well, you, in a sense, well, you hadn't gone, come from being pure tech to clean technologies. You had been the environmentalist, but the paths then converged. Well, it, it had been percolating uh, for many, many years. And that first fund we did, uh, while we made some good investments, it was super difficult and, and there was not enforcement of laws. And so we learned a lot from that uh, episode to apply to our first uh, impact fund in 2004, where we did the power light and solar city Tesla. Was so, that with was that still with Hambrick and Quist, or have you now moved on because you were then with uh, with J with JP Morgan, right? Well, what happened is Hambrick and Quist went public in '98, was acquired by Chase in I don't know okay. 2000, and then Chase acquired JP Morgan. Okay, so that's how you ended up. Okay, and and so then yeah. now those early, so you then ended up and you just listed some investments, but they went past very fast. You did Solar City. You did what? Well, this was early. This is 2000. Actually, before we did the first environmental investment we did in, in our first uh, impact fund was PowerLight, um, which was sold to SunPower about, you know, it's the, it's the distribution, the big distribution piece of SunPower now. Okay. So that was, that was in. Um, so no just for, our, for those, there'll be some people on the, you know, in the audience, hopefully, who, who are coming into this and don't know all of the names and the, you know, just, just how, how, how central you've been to some of these developments. When you say the distribution piece of SunPower, what was PowerLight's business model? Just very briefly, the, it was putting solar onto roofs. Yeah, like the Moscone Center in San Francisco, which was one of the first big buildings to have solar, uh, PowerLight did that. Okay. Uh, what was some and of the other ones? They were, they were more commercial and they weren't residential in the early days, but um, right. bigger rooms. You, know, you needed bigger has, rooms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so um, Tom Dinwoody and Dan Sugar were were the president and CEO there, and we we invested with them. And they were going to go public. They they had hired Morgan Stanley, but we got that offer from SunPower that was too good to pass up. So that's how that happened. And in that and then, fund, what are, what are some of the other names that you did around then? Yeah, so that 
uh, Powerlight. Uh, we did Tesla in 2006. Well, we did yes. in 2007, I believe. Um, and then we, a funny, funny story, we worked again with Dan Sugar, who we had worked with the Powerlight when he started Next Tracker. We were uh, early investors there. Uh, so, um, and then and then Bellwether Coffee, which ne is deep Next Tracker. I, now, Dan Sugar, Next Tracker. That's the that that's the one that do, that, that does the tracking technology, uh, does it not? Yes. Well, yeah, that's still very, that's a, that's still. I mean, that's a big name today, right? Yeah, it's it's a behemoth. I mean, I think they, they have the leading market share. They're now part of uh, Flextronics. They uh, we sold to them uh, several years ago, but Dan Sugar is still there. And He's still there. And, I visited with him just a couple of years ago. I was out actually um, talking to a company I don't think you're in, which is uh, ChargePoint, which is something that I have, uh, as an angel, I went into and I visited them in California and I did this little little tour and I ended up with Flextronics and uh, and talking to the yeah. Next Tracker team. So, but okay, before we get on to Tesla, which we're gonna have to talk about because it's a big deal. Um, you, just one question, going back to the this thing about, you know, you have all these, technologists coming out of the sort of dot-com period and sort of some of them looking around and looking for the next big, but when did you realize, when did you, or did, was, was there ever a point where you said, okay, the internet is transformational, but here's where it'll actually get applied. You know, in it'll, it, it actually solves some of those problems around the environmental technologies that couldn't have been solved in a 1990 environment. Did, did you ever have that thought explicitly? Well, clearly the, the internet changes all sectors. And, and we, since we uh, at HQ, we banked a lot of those early entrants like Netscape and such, we saw that early. I will say though, that the, the clean energy opportunity really came from, started from a different place. And it started from the fact that we became the first impact venture capital firm of scale. Uh, by virtue of raising an impact fund uh, with foundations and banks. And we were, we were really interested in job creation for lower income people and for people that didn't have college degrees necessarily. And so that opened our eyes to, and, and, and we had to prove that to some of our investors that we could create these jobs. So that opened our eyes early to companies like Powerlight that were hiring tons of people Solar City, you know, the, uh, now the rooftop installation job is the third fastest growing yeah. category, according to the Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics. Back then it was unheard of, but we thought, hey, if this, if this catches on, we're going to create a lot of amazingly good jobs. So that was how we, we got into clean energy, in addition to our, our just belief, you know, Al Gore had had done an inconvenient truth. We we felt, hey, things are different this time than they were in 1990 when well, we this did is 2005, our... six, presumably. Yeah. So we just felt, hey, the world is actually waking up to this, and it's not just um, the the advocacy groups. It's becoming more, more mainstream. Even though it took a long time to be yeah. mainstream, we we said something was up. Yeah, and the, the jobs thing, and that's so interesting because, um, so you really did come into this from a different route to Ramiz Nam and, and Alka and, uh, and myself and so on. But, um, but the jobs thing really resonates now, of course, because we're all, uh, we may be about to be doing a green uh, new deal, but in Europe, they are yeah. doing a green deal. And of course, the COVID recovery, uh, I've argued, you know, needs to be built around an energy efficiency drive for exactly that reason. You, these distributed technologies are the ones that are going to create all the jobs. It's going to be the yeah. roofs, it's going to be the batteries, it's going to be uh, the the um, the insulation and and uh, you know moving to heat pumps, those sorts of things. It's going to employ millions of people around the world. Yeah, and, and already do. I mean, it's. There are uh, more, there are like over 3 million Americans that are employed in, in clean energy right now and, and, and growing uh, more than fossil fuels. So this, this is a good thing. Uh, it's partly how the industry has accumulated the political capital that it has that has allowed it to level the playing field with the incumbents. Yeah, demonstrably creating those jobs. Okay, so you've, you've got this fun and now... Um, 2007, you said that you invested in Tesla. You were in the first institutional round. It was actually um, 
2006. Two, so sorry, 2006. So it really was, wow. You, you, so I'm really interested in these moments when light bulbs go on. And, you know, was it just, um, you know, who did you first meet? Was this... Um, did, did, we did, met, uh, we first met J.B. Straubel. Uh, right, at Straubel, a, yeah, yeah. A meeting at Stanford that uh, we had been introduced to him. And again, our mission helped to, to open our eyes to an opportunity that a more traditional lens uh, would have uh, missed, frankly. Because when we heard J.B., obviously being climate oriented, we were like, whoa, we, we, electric cars are something that we should, we should have in the society. There had been the, the decade earlier, the, the GM disaster with electric vehicles and who killed the electric car and all of that. But we said, you know what, we think it actually might work this time because people are more uh, oriented towards the, the climate implications. And plus this is gonna be a really fast, great car that people, you know, there won't be any sacrifice. In, in driving this thing. Um, so that was super exciting to us. We also, because of this jobs focus, we said, huh, and if, if the car company does even half of what it's expected to do, it will hire a lot of people because you need a lot of people to, to build cars. And so again, that focus on um, creating high quality companies that create high quality jobs within your own society, as opposed to offshore, um, was something that we were very hopeful about. Uh, we didn't know. Okay. And so that, that, that weighed in to our decision to invest in Tesla, even though everyone at the time thought it was a stupid idea. Well, that's right. And, 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 um, and I was one of those. I'm going to be. I'm going to be honest. Um, I've had this conversation with Ira Aaron Price, who will, will no doubt show up in this conversation at some point. Um, yeah. Because you know, it's hard now, perhaps, to remember just how stupid of an idea it was to start a new car company. I mean, it was a laugh line in my pre my summit presentations at the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Summit, because I talked through. Um, in fact, I used it as an explanation why we shouldn't care that Solyndra went bankrupt. And I said, look, there were 500 car companies at one point, and now there are three. And then I said, or maybe four, because there's this company called Tesla that thinks it's gonna join the big time. That's so ridiculous. And, I, and everybody laughed. I mean, we're talking probably at that time, it would have been 2000 and probably nine, 10, you know, but, you know, obviously we all know where we are now, which is that Tesla's market cap is bigger than all of those companies, those surviving uh, car companies combined. Um, so it really was a wild bet, was it not? Or did you always think because of you, because you had been conditioned differently, did you always think now nah, this is a no brainer, this is going to work? Well, um, you know, we had no idea, obviously, of what it would become because uh, it, it's just a colossus. I mean, it, it, it's a, one of the world's most significant companies and, and you don't go into any investment thinking that will necessarily happen. I mean, obviously you, you hope it does. But what we did know was that it would redefine the, the opportunity because it was not asking people to sacrifice a fast, uh, beautiful car in order to do the right thing for the climate. It, it was a, it, it allowed you to do both. And we felt that gave it an advantage. We had no idea of all of the technical hurdles we would have to overcome, the regulatory uh, advantages of the incumbents, be that the car companies or the car dealership laws. I mean, there was, there was just a, a litany of, of obstacles in our path. But so we didn't really think about the future. We, we thought more about survival and, and just, you know, knocking down one obstacle after another. Fortunately, um, in California, we, we had the California Air Resources Board, which was on the same page, more or less. Um, not that there weren't, uh, you know, conflicts, but they, back then, they were saying to Honda and others, if you don't sell emission-free vehicles, you need to um, you buy credits uh, to make up for that. And so, and you know, can I ask, was that under was that already under Mary? It's Mary Nichols, yes. isn't it? And, yeah. and that was 
another great woman leader in the space. And uh, so she was also one of your allies in that. Uh, and when you say we for, uh, for Tesla, you were on the board. So that must have felt very we like you must have been there in the trenches alongside uh, the, the J, JB Straubel and, and Elon and the team. Yeah, well, I was a board observer, but very, very active. And yeah. and what one of the things we did was work with the company to figure out where where is the place to build that Model S. It was called White Star back then. Um, and we because of our jobs focus. We were we were we worked to see can we actually build this locally as opposed to overseas or some other place and uh, so uh, we worked with team members at Tesla to come up with sites um, and we went through many sites before we got to the the old Numi plant which was of course the biggest prize of all um, but this notion of of uh, manufacturing locally. Uh, was another controversial facet of Tesla's um, yeah. evolution. And we were super supportive for it, um, both in terms of the business rationale, which is to keep manufacturing and R&D and headquarters within a reasonable commuting distance, because it's so iterative in those early days. From our mission point of view, we wanted to prove that um, you could still build uh, cost-effective car factories in the Western US. And, and the first gigafactory, the decision to g vertically integrate all the way back into batteries, was that taken while uh, you were on the board? Uh, that happened later, um, after the company had gone public. We, we worked on the Fremont plant, uh, the process leading up to the car plant in Fremont, California. And then when the company went public, I mean, we, we certainly helped a little bit, but uh, we, we were now working on our other companies in our portfolio because we were you know, in a position to exit that investment. And I, I want to ask about that. Um, I, I'm sure it's in the public uh, disclosures. You know, when did you exit? How long did you, because of course, you know, um, you know, Tesla had this phenomenal, ferocious run up since the IPO. So did you get to the IPO and say, well, thank goodness, we, we dodged a bullet. Let's get out of this as quickly as possible. We've done well. Or did you say, no, no, we're going to stay in and, and ride this up for a while? Uh, we, we exited at various times. Um, and of course, we couldn't exit at the IPO uh, for securities laws reasons. Um, yeah. So it was sort of a, a continual uh, distribution. We didn't sell the stock. We distributed it to our investors. Right. And the some, of, some of them own it to this day. Well, the reason I ask, uh, coming back to Ira, um, Ira Aaron Price, because I had this conversation with him before the IPO, uh, saying, "You're mad, a car company. You're a venture capitalist, Ira. What are you thinking?" And no, no, it's going to be fantastic, and it's going to be great. And and I said, "Well, I beg to differ. I think this is going to end in tears." And of course, it was this magnificent IPO, very successful. And I met Ira shortly after that, and I said. I hope that as soon as that lockup that you mentioned in the securities laws, as soon as that expires, I hope you're getting out because, you know, this thing cannot possibly continue to defy gravity. No, he said, you don't understand anything. I was like, okay, I beg to differ. He was right. I was wrong magnificently because I know that he did ride it for quite some time. Maybe not, I mean, maybe like yourself, he was building down his, his holdings, but he, he did, he was very committed after the IPO as well. Well, I was my partner, and of course, we well, we and then we exactly. Felt, I want to get onto that. Yeah, we we have a lot of stories to tell from those early days, and of course, Ira remains on the the Tesla board. So, um, but you know, as a fund manager, uh, you have to your your LPs have a certain time frame, and so you're always yeah. juggling what you think the value is versus what their needs are, and so it, you know, it's a process, and and it's a quality problem to have. You know, I've made. I've made so much money on this one. Do I stay in and make more, or do I and, and so? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I want to say, Michael, you're not you're not alone in ha in that skepticism. So uh, it happened so long ago, and there were so many people that just read the riot act on, on this. And, and I think it, maybe, it's there's one, <laughs> maybe there's one lesson. If we're going to generalize some lessons here, um, which is that 
you know, you were very conditioned by your background, environmentalism, and then this, um, this, this uh, attempt to create jobs. And so you were using a different lens when you were looking at investments. Then there's a bunch of us that came out of more, I would say, sort of IT type technology that used lenses and noticed things like the experience curve in solar very early. Um, but I've got a mechanical engineering, but I've worked in car factories to put myself through college. And that was conditioned me to, you know, to be very skeptical if I would have walked away from that deal and look how wrong, you know, that would have been. So our experiences condition the opportunities that we jump on, that we like and that we that we understand. It's so true. And, and also your connection to your community. What a lot of people that don't live around here don't realize is that that new plant was a huge economic engine of the region for many, many years. Um, starting with, with GM. And when it shuttered, there were 5,000 jobs that were lost. And, and that, that Fremont area went from being a star player in the Bay Area's uh, economic development to, to being left out. And so it really was a, a huge dislocation in our region when that plant shuttered. And so the ability to bring it back, have it address 21st century needs, which for, for low carbon, as opposed to gasoline powered uh, cars, was you know, the chance of a lifetime. And, and now we're all benefiting from, from that transition. That's such an important story um, for this week. If it wasn't election week in the US, there's something else going on in our space, which is the German uh, Industry Association, the VDI, um, the Verbund Deutsche Industrie, the German Industry sort of Trade Association, has again um, produced a piece of research showing that uh, diesel is better uh, in terms of emissions than electric vehicles. It's complete and utter yeah. rubbish. Um, Alka Hoekstra, yeah. I've mentioned, is the great, I call him the debunker in chief. He's had to waste more days explaining to this. And what you've got is these, these you know, organizations and people and companies that are terrified of those job losses. But instead mm -hmm. of saying, well, we're, we're going to lean in, we're going to create uh, new jobs, new value for the 21st century, they're actually just producing this nonsensical um, you know, uh, analysis to, that, that try to mislead people into not yeah. doing the obviously right thing. It's, it's, it happens all the time in our our practice with the solar and just the rooftop solar guys. Oh, the cost of net metering, it's a cost shift instead of a revenue loss. I mean, the incumbents, I mean, it's understandable. They want to hang on to the, the great trajectory that they've, they've built over, you know, in some case a century. And so they don't, they don't want these, these uh, new entrants to come in and, and they have, a, you know, there's a regulatory capture, there's, um, you know, they can hire the experts, they do have an advantage. And that's why in our practice, um, impact investing, it's super important to pay attention to pay attention to policy and to jump in. You're not going to win every policy battle, but you can't do this. Uh, you can't upend whether it's the transportation industry from the early 20th century or now as we're decarbonizing agriculture, a company we have Farmers Business Network, you know, they're, they're taking on companies that will be you know, like John Deere, uh, the whole model from the 1800s. And, and so there's just an accumulated uh, advantage that these companies have in uh, policy, in getting access to experts and, and trying to own the narrative. And so that's what, you know, people like you and people like me are, you know, we spend a lot of our time um, undoing that. Well, that was the opportunity that, you know, New Energy Finance, we ended up sort of sitting between the policy people, the finance people, the energy companies, the tech companies, and, and trying to translate in those sort of four languages. But it would be wrong um, to have this conversation and not to talk about that weird period of sort of 2006, 7, 8, when suddenly everybody piles in and they start trying to do clean tech. And they don't, I, in my view, they don't understand this piece about the policy they don't understand how capital intensive it is they don't understand how policy intensive there's a whole bunch of mistakes were you looking at that at the time and saying this is going to end in tears these 1400 new venture capital companies with clean tech and climate funds this is just going to be like the dot-com boom bust 
you know, were you, did you yeah. know that at the time? Well, uh, we, we call that period the period where the tourists came in, you know. Ah, the tourists. <laughs> tourists. Uh, because, you know, many of them came from great tech backgrounds. Tech was at the doldrums. Let's, let's do this. But then when it, when it got difficult and tech rebounded, many of them left. So that's why we call them tourists. Have, and have you, have you, you know, actually have you met John Dore um, and, uh, and told him that you call him a tourist? Well, I've known John Doerr since way, way before that. And, and certainly, uh, you know, Klein Perkins has continued to, yeah, in, in some of its offshoots uh, to invest in this sector. So, um, you know, and one of my CEOs, the company I just mentioned, FBN, uh, the CEO there, the co-founder is a former Kleiner partner. So uh, I think that Kleiner, you know, has, has uh, while everyone had their difficulties, they, yeah. They're, they have been there for the long haul, and and the the other efforts they've spawned, um, like um, other uh, GTV, uh, blanking on the name, but anyway, they I think they they deserve a place in the ecosystem for for many reasons. But those other a lot of firms came and went, and yeah, they they didn't realize that it, it the capital intensity uh, in parts of the business the the role of policy and not just like I was a life science investor for a while and there you know you know that the FDA can make or break a company it's not like this is unique to clean energy but that's the what food, is unique. the food and drugs administration sorry to interrupt I just make oh, sure yeah. because not everybody is uh, going to be U.S. based so the food yeah and so you know as a life science yeah. investor that whatever country you're in there's a regulatory body that that calls the shots in terms of whether a drug is approved or not. So this notion that clean tech is, is unique in that is, is nonsense. But what is different in, at least in the States, is that um, the regulations in our, our sector, every single state, I mean, it's like you could have 50 different versions of, of solar regulation or car dealerships. And so it, you know, there isn't this national ed energy policy that unifies it all. And so you just, you, you hire your people in Washington, DC and you're done with it. Uh, in, in this industry, so much is done at the regional level and the state level that you have a whole different uh, army of, of efforts. That's right, because you've got the, a, the, a lot of policy in the 50 states. And uh, of course, sitting here in London or uh, in Europe, um, there's this kind of myth that, oh, well, you know, you have the EU and then you just have to send people to Brussels and it's all sorted. And, and, and not only do you have different uh, region or different states, you've got different countries, you've got different languages. So the, the yeah. myth of these huge markets being so attractive to startups is actually, it's, it's, I mean, it is a myth. You've really got to succeed um, battle by battle and, and location yeah. by location, don't you? It's so true. I mean, it's been gratifying to see some of some of the really good laws uh, in California and a few other states take hold and be replicated. And and you know, who knows if we have a change in administration, uh, we may see some of these more supportive uh, regulatory approaches occur at a, a national level. But I'm not. I, I don't think we'll we'll have a national energy policy yeah. anytime. <laughs> and, and thank you very much for that reminder if we have a new administration because as we uh, are recording this the vote counting continues in uh in Wis no i think wisconsin is done but in uh in, in michigan in uh um one of the carolinas <laughs> south carolina in uh, georgia and in nevada and so on so we're both at least i'm a little bit on tenterhooks and i know as soon as we finish recording i'll be on the phone uh, on the you know try trying to figure out what's happened Absolutely. We're, we're taking time away from checking our Twitter feed here, <laughs> but it's worth it. Well, and, and uh, oh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm delighted you, you, you said that. Um, and obviously we are at a watershed and I don't think we, um, I don't think we should spend much time hypothesizing about one or the other um, uh, president, but it is a, a, a watershed moment. Um, how much does this decision of the new administration, the new president, how much does it matter given that so much happens at the state level? Well, of course, I've always, you know, I'm a big, 
in my profession, you have to be an optimist because you encounter so many obstacles. Uh, you need that, that attitude. So I'm always the one that says, oh, it's okay that the, we don't have stuff at the national level because we have these strong regions and, and especially California, which is the largest state. Um, you know, we, we, we have enough of a market without it. And, and it's true. I mean, we have been able to make a huge amount of progress. But what I really think is, wouldn't it be great to have both leading regional efforts and a, a federal government that takes the best of these, these laws and turns them into uh, national policies, like be that cap and trade, be that the low carbon fuel standard. And there are all kinds of proven uh, policies that, that are not pilots. I mean, California is what, the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. And we can learn a lot of lessons here. We can learn them from Massachusetts, from New York, I mean, from Washington. I mean, there's, there's just, um, there are some precedents that we should be uh, surfacing uh, at the federal level. And so that would be a difference. Uh, I think that would happen were Biden to become president. Yeah, and there's also the international um, context here. Um, the UK is gonna be the host to COP26, The the mm -hmm. next climate negotiations exactly this time next year in Glasgow and you know in one version of the future you've got the UK the EU Japan South Korea and now China all committed to net zero by 2050 in China's case 2060 if the US were and Canada and if the US were to join that group you would have then three quarters yeah. of the global economy committed to a mid-century net zero target. Um, yes. But in another version of the future, you don't have that. So it is pretty, it's, it is a fork in the road, isn't it? Yeah, this is, this is a huge opportunity for our generation and for future generations, yeah, to get that scale, that, 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 that unanimous approach. Um, so I, I hope that, I hope that will happen. And just as an example of something in our portfolio now, in the er very early days, like PowerLite back in 2006, that I mentioned we sold to SunPower, the California Energy Commission was giving out grants and loans to solar companies just to help them get started. Um, and you know that helped build what is now a huge global industry. Um, and we, what I see now the CEC doing, which gives me great hope, is. Um, they're putting out requests for proposals for all electric buildings. And meanwhile, there, there are many cities, especially on the West Coast, that are banning natural gas in new buildings. And so I feel that these early signals of a move to electric and to you know, a green grid that we're seeing are going to uh, bear fruit and that you know, 10 years from now, this, this will be a hot sector and, and there'll be companies up and down that, that building sector and appliance sector that will benefit. And one of our companies of today, Bellwether Coffee, is, is, a, is using electric roasting to replace natural gas-based roasting of coffee. I mean, it's such a, it's a genius idea. It's cleaner, it's cheaper. The coffee, because you can, it's like a solar city for, for coffee roasters. You can right. put it coffee shop, you get this wonderful, freshly roasted coffee that tastes a lot better. It's that whole no sacrifice approach. You're, you're doing the right thing for the climate right. and getting a better cup of coffee. And in the US alone, there's 400 million cups of coffee consumed every single day. So right. So big... Bellwether Coffee is now one of my most favorite companies. I'm going to talk about it all the time. And the reason is this, uh, I was going to ask you about Hydrogen, you said everything, you know, get, get these electric buildings. There is a huge sort of full court press going on um, uh, from a lot of industrial players. There's also a whole load of what you call these uh, venture capital tourists who have decided that it's time finally for hydrogen to be the thing. And I don't know if you noticed, I've just written a piece. I've written two pieces on hydrogen, one on the supply side, one on the demand side. And one of the big things that was a, an eye opener as I wrote that, that demand side piece is all industrial heating pretty much can go to electric. It doesn't have to go to hydrogen. 
Uh, there's just, in fact, as you think about it, there's no good reason for a lot of it to go to hydrogen. In fact, you know, it may be, there may be exceptional situations where you do. Um, and of course, coffee roasting is one of the examples that you could do absolutely electrically. And there's probably somebody out there who hates this broadcast, this, this podcast, uh, because they have got a hydrogen-based coffee roaster that they're determined is the answer <laughs> to everybody's problems. Yes, it, absolutely. It's um, hydrogen for us is, is not the, the path of, of, um, of, of efficiency and Bellwether coffee is an example of that. Why, inter why put hydrogen in that equation when the, elect the distributed electric um, roaster is cheaper, better, faster? And I think we'll, we'll see that across the board. And even unlike the solar industry where the utilities were threatened by rooftop solar, even the utilities like it because they don't have to, they're not going to get stranded gas uh, infrastructure assets uh, by these laws and these regulations that push for um, all electric buildings. They're, it's right in their sweet spot. So I, I see this as a- For the, for the electric utilities, yes. One of yeah. the you know, one of the big um, the, the big voices pushing towards hydrogen is, of course, the people who own the, the natural gas distribution networks, because they are, you know, they, they are. Uh, I don't want to say panicking or freaking out, but they are. They're freaking out that if you're if you're pushing all these buildings to have all these fabulous technologies and all of industrial uh, heating goes electric, then your gas, you know, you're still going to need gas for I don't know, uh, back, yeah. well, for backup. Uh, power generation and potentially, as I've written about, maybe hydrogen for backup power generation, but you'll do it in a large central hub in an industrial port city. You won't do it. You won't, you won't need those retail distribution gas networks anymore. Exactly. And, and the, you'll reduce the transportation that hub and spoke generates a lot of carbon in the driving to and from the plant. Oh, we've, we've done a, a a calculator for how much you save, and it's a 90% reduction uh, in, in uh, the coffee roasting pro process, 90% reduction in carbon. And even, um, you're right about the gas utilities, but even PG&E that is both gas and electric is supporting this move to all electric buildings because they just don't want to be saddled with um, stranded assets someday that is new gas infrastructure today, but then becomes regulated out of existence later. Well, that's right. I mean, at some point they're going, so at some point players like that are going to have to walk away from some assets. So, you know, the right calculation is to do it earlier and not exactly. as we're seeing with these, you know, the, the German industry association, this kind of postcard from the future of having to say more and more extremely stupid things to justify, uh, uh, you know, not walking away from your stranded assets. Exactly. And, and so I love it when innovation and policy and investment kind of all come together right. and we can avoid some of those, those uh, unproductive paths. Yeah. I'm just conscious of time. It's moving on. And we've got two more topics that I think uh, I'd love for you to, to I'd love to talk uh, with you about. One is the stuff that you're doing in the developing world. And the other is the stuff that we uh, do together, but you're much more actively involved than I am on the Hawthorne Club uh, for uh, energy, uh, women energy executives. So let's make sure we cover those two off. Um, okay. You've got um, uh, off, well, off-grid electric was one of your investments and it's now called Zola. Um, mm -hmm. Talk me through the genesis of that and, and what is it? Be again, you know, did you come to it because you wanted to do something, it was the right thing to do to be involved uh, in the developing world or, or, um, or, or was it the opportunity that kind of led you to that? A good question. Um, Zola, was an investment that I first we first got to know because Solar City invested in it, uh, and part of that is the uh, the founders of Solar City, the Wright brothers, were from South Africa, and they uh, saw this company that was selling um, small solar systems to places in Africa that didn't have electricity as just very compelling, and they wanted to be helpful, and so that that was how I first got to know about it. Um, and they were on the board. 
Uh, and then we invested in a, in a subsequent round uh, because we felt that um, and anyone that spent five minutes in Legos, for example, knows we, you know, we have a problem if we don't uh, improve the, the infrastructure in Africa where all the population growth is happening, where there isn't sufficient um, electricity infrastructure to meet the needs of today, let alone um, 20 years from now when Nigeria will be larger in population than the United States. So we have to do something. And so what, what happened with Zola is they started as many do in that going to rural areas, small systems that allow a house to have lighting, have um, phone chargers, set up a little uh, business um, outside their home. And, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, and they, they have huge, um, you know, over a gigawatt of, of that. But what we invested in very soon after um, the, the series that we, we were leading is to, to address the urban market and to go after the use of diesel generators, which is uh, an endemic to, to the developing world. I think there are 20 to 30 million uh, diesel generators out there and they're horrible, not just for the environment in terms of the, the carbon that's created, but for health, I mean, the, the particulates, the noise, um, and, and these are in people's apartments or they're in places they just shouldn't be because the grid goes out every day. And so they wanna keep their air conditioning, their fridge, and so they buy a generator. Um, and so we, the company Zola spent a few years developing a product and with uh, Enphase, um, was, uh, we have a relationship with them to allow your, um, electricity to stay on, just to go seamlessly from your solar to the grid, and then when the grid goes down to your storage battery, without having to redo anything, you don't even notice it's happening, and it's it's not, uh, you know, it's it's cost competitive, and thereby eliminating a really bad actor in the developing world, which is that that diesel genset, and so that's that's where the company is its future will be more in that. And that allows you to tap into a, a pan-African solution as opposed to just the rural areas uh, and use business development tools, uh, work with other uh, large companies in Africa that want to sell a lot of, um, of, of electricity to urban populations. So that's that's been an exciting, you know, it's, it's always really difficult to do things in the developing world, uh, but, uh, we're very, very excited about this new product that Zola has developed. Very good. And and how many countries is it currently operating in? It's in, uh, let's say, East Africa, so Tanzania. Um, it's in Lagos. It's in Cote d'Ivoire. It's uh, about four or five. Okay, but. With this new product, we're, we're working with, like, I, we haven't announced it yet, but one of the major uh, African sort of electronics companies that would be in South Africa and Mozambique and, and other places. So uh, it, we'll quickly see um, across the board solution that's, that's applicable throughout the continent. That's great. And I have a, 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 a tiny, I'm not on your scale of investing, I have a tiny angel investment in something called Azuri that operates in uh, Kenya and uh, of, uh, Tanzania and a, and a few others. And um, But I'm also an advisor to a company called Ignite Solar, which is designing um, medical devices that are, I call it designed for solar because I, I did a project in, um, in Sierra Leone with my wife as of today, my wife, um, and we put solar and batteries into a neonatal clinic, which was suffering from power cuts. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the babies need, um, they need warmth and they need oxygen and 20 minutes without mains power and they start dying. So we put in power there. Um, but the mm -hmm. opportunity to do medical devices that are very much lower power, energy efficiency plus solar supply, uh, is very compelling, um, and particularly uh, you know in this pandemic, we we now yes. realise just how important it is to get medical services, and just ticking boxes and saying countries have got access or this village has got access, 
these many people have got access. If it's not reliable, it's not really, it, it doesn't do the job, does it? No, not at all. And, and certainly, you know, one benefit, I mean, there are no benefits to, to COVID, but to see people focus on uh, better uh, healthcare delivery in, in the developing world and, and using clean energy and distributed energy to do that is, is at least some kind of a silver lining. And, right. and, and Joel has been involved in that as well, but it's so critical. So let me give a plug for anybody who's listening or watching to uh, cleaning up episode number 16, which is in fact airing as we film this and as they count the votes in those uh, last few states in the US uh, presidential election. Episode 16 is with Kande Yamkeller, who was the founding leader of Sustainable Energy for All. And so those who are interested in those issues should, as soon as this episode is over, not before, go over and watch episode 16. Um, so I want to come on to the Hawthorne Club. Um, Mead Harris, just this extraordinary visionary, decided that women in energy needed their own networking organization. Um, or was it you that gave her the idea? Or how, how did you, oh, how did you, right, tell, was, me, tell me how you got involved. Long, long before I met her, I mean, she's a, a, a dynamo. I mean, she's just incredibly energetic and, and she flies from London to, to Melbourne, like most people, you know, go to their favorite lunch shop. <laughs> She's just been peripatetic and, and not, has developed. Not right now she doesn't. Australia has locked down. There are no international flights. Yeah. Very, very few. I, so, uh, I yeah, think normally, did, but normally, yes. I think she did one of the last events before the lockdown in Australia. Yeah, so everything's virtual now and, and we've done a lot of good Zooms together. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the ability that Mead has to bring together, what's, what's really neat for me is that obviously I'm very connected to the clean energy community uh, and, and derive a huge amount of support and value from that. What I'm less connected to is the more traditional energy, the historic energy industry. And what's great about the Hawthorne Club that brings senior women together across the world uh, from old energy to new energy and everything in between. And so instead of just talking to, within our bubbles, uh, we, we you know, have lunch with or dinner with or drinks with um, women that have accomplished a huge amount um, in sectors that like, I don't know much about and even some that I, I feel uh, that you know, need a lot of improvement. So it's, it's a great way to broaden your understanding of, of uh, how energy has evolved over the, the years and meet amazing women in, in the process. And, and me just, you know, deserves a huge, huge, uh, you know, I owe her a debt of gratitude. And, and she brings together, you know, Mary Nichols, I mean, the public sector, the private sector. Uh, it's, it's just a great, a, a great opportunity. And having you there as our, <laughs> our token man, you're, you're such, you have such, <laughs> You have such a, a, a sense of humor and, and you're, you're really good at, uh, at helping us with, with so many of our, our programs. That's quite a hole you're digging for yourself there. So I'm the token man, but it's okay because I got a sense of humor. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, so it's been I, a pleasure to have you as part of our advisory board. So sure. I, I, met, I met Mead because in 2015, I wrote a piece about the need for inclusive energy um, what I said was that we've got this incredible transformation going on in you know, uh, the energy sector, and it is inconceivable. Two things are inconceivable. One, that it could possibly be as fast and effective if 50% of the world's population is underrepresented in that transformation. And the other thing that is absolutely inconceivable is that at the end of it, that management of the energy sector would look just the same as, as it did before. Basically, uh, a load of, you know, in the developed world, a load of sort of mi middle-aged white men running everything. That's not what it's gonna look like. So I wrote this piece and I met Mead and I thought what she was doing was tremendous. And she invited me on the international advisory uh, group. <laughs> and I am now the token, well, I'm, I don't, I think she'd be actually very unhappy to, 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 for that with those words to be used. I think she would, I'm, I am the only guy, but I don't think I'm a token, at least I, I, I hope not. I, I was joking, I was joking. That's okay, yeah. you're, for, you're forgiven as always. <laughs> um, 
but we do need to get um, we do need to get Mead onto uh, cleaning up to talk more about that. But um, we've talked about how you are as an investor only as good as the soil in which the ideas that you come across falls. You are you are the sum of your experiences. You're the sum of yourself to to your um, your past, your persona because that's what helps you know whether you should or shouldn't make these investments and helps you to see them. To what extent do you think the fact that you are a woman and one of the few women venture capitalists, frankly, in the industry, um, how has that helped you be so successful or has it? Well, I, I would say that um, it, it actually has been helpful because there is a novelty factor. And uh, while the there are obstacles in your path as long as you know I, I was lucky in that when I went off on my own I had worked for a long time and so I had a network I had bought you know very supportive bosses most of them male uh, and so it, it's not just the soil that you, you speak of it's all it's your network your peaks and and the and the credibility that you can establish and so I think that um for me, there were so many, uh, having worked for so many years, there were people that valued what I did, valued my perspective. And when it, when it became clear that there was a shot to do something that was out of the ordinary, to, to start a, a firm or a fund um, in, in this new impact space and as a, uh, with a woman leader, um, they you know, they don't get, they didn't get that chance very often. And so in some ways people go out of their way to help you because they realize, uh, you know, what a desert it's been. And so as a, as a pioneer, they, they didn't have that many choices. And so I was the beneficiary of kind of a goodwill and, and not really having many outlets for that goodwill on the part of some senior people that were in my network. Okay, so that's very interesting because if I summarized correctly, it's not so much that you saw deals differently and it made you a different person who sees value, but that there was definitely some advantage to being just very successful and very good at what you do, but also one of the very few women that, you know, that, that was out there that could manage money on behalf of the investors. Yeah, I think it's both. I mean, because... The, the more integrative approach that you take as an impact investor, looking at uh, social trends and um, gaps in, in policy as they relate to innovation, um, that's how we got to many of the very successful companies that we've invested in. It wasn't the, the linear, just what's the latest technical gizmo that is better than you know, the 10 others out there. So uh, it does, it's much more highly differentiated. Nancy, that's probably a great question on which to leave this uh, because we are out of time. The question of whether women investors bring a different perspective, which helps them to unlock different sources of value in deals of all sorts, not just venture deals. Uh, I'll have a think about uh, maybe bringing in some of the Hawthorne Club's members uh, and we can uh, dive into that question. And certainly in venture capital, there are still so few women uh, and so few entrepreneurs, CEOs of venture-backed startups, that it's definitely one of the most important questions, I think, uh, that we could look at. Um, but I would like to thank you for joining me on this um, election results day. Um, I saw, I'm sorry that I you know, dragged you away from your, uh, your, your, your phone and from the results. Hopefully there'll be some good news when we finish this uh, recording. Yeah. But it's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Well, and likewise, on, on your special day, um, personally, and, and this very special day uh, for the United States and, and the rest of the world, I, I, it, it's a pleasure to take time and um, reminisce, and, and also, but also to, to identify how important this field is. And you've played such a critical role in spreading the word and, and database um, coverage and insights uh, and you know just it's it's uplifting for me and and it just feels like we are just getting started I mean and now uh, with a little luck we'll have 
you know, the wind in our sails and um, we'll get to that point where, you know, our children and our grandchildren will, will wonder, well, why didn't you do this a lot earlier? And when they look at a pod, uh, look at this kind of a, a discussion, they'll realize, well, it wasn't as easy as you think it was, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. No, that, that's right. I think uh, hopefully they will look back and understand that there were these eras uh, and you couldn't do in 2030 what we were doing in 2020 or in 2010 or in year mm -hmm. 2000. But you've been such an integral part of that, that when they do write that history, I know there's going to be a chapter on Nancy Fund. Thanks for joining uh, me. You're very kind. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And uh, look forward to our, our next rendezvous, which I, I hope will be in person. Very good. Thank you. That was Nancy Fund one of the very few women running major venture capital companies and also one of the most successful venture investors of our times. And an early investor, 2006, in Tesla and a former board member. My guest next week on Cleaning Up is Mike Bennett. He runs Z Energy in New Zealand. That's the fuel distribution company. He's an extraordinary visionary though, working to prepare that company for the transition to net zero, which is the pathway New Zealand is on. He's also the founder of New Zealand's Climate Leaders Coalition. That's a group of business people who've got together to chart that path to net zero and to lead as quickly as possible in that direction. He's a tremendous charismatic, visionary figure I think you're going to enjoy next week with Mike Bennett. If you're enjoying cleaning up, then I have a favor to ask. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please give us a five-star review. That really helps us move up the search rankings. Similarly, if you're watching on YouTube, then give us a thumbs up, again, because it helps more people find cleaning up and enjoy these conversations with extraordinary people. And don't forget that you can also subscribe to alerts in a number of ways so that you never miss an episode. There's a newsletter alert you can subscribe to on cleaningup.live on the internet, or you can follow at ML Cleaning Up, that's ML Cleaning Up on Twitter. And of course, on podcast platforms, you can just subscribe to Cleaning Up. Thank you very much. Let's get the word out. And finally, I'd like to thank our new sponsor, the Giladini Foundation. Until now, I've met the very modest costs of cleaning up myself through the Liebreich Foundation. The Giladini Foundation's support will enable us to get the word out to a bigger audience, and we're very, very grateful. Mm -hmm.